Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I'm going to open the first uh, session of um, that, if I may add, extremely interesting conference with an extremely interesting, and allow me please to characterize it as under-researched subject, which is more or less at the core of Germany's relations for many decades. People were dealing with culture, science, and knowledge, but having done research about that subject is somehow something which has to be done in the meantime. So our first session opens up the workshop, the conference. It's even much larger than a workshop. Um, and we have three speakers. Uh, the first speaker is Professor Hanof Gutfreund, who is known to everybody, an eminent, I would even say most eminent professor, um, emeritus in theoretical physics at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, former president of the university, and the former rector of the university, and one of the most involved persons and personalities in the German-Israeli scientific dialogue. So he is presently the chairman of the executive committee of the Israeli Science Foundation and is extremely active and coordinates while promoting the <coughs> legacy uh, of uh, Albert Einstein. Just from the very beginning concerning the procedure, everybody of you has 20 minutes and I have to be strict in order to be fair to the others and to the other, uh, to the other um, sessions. 20 minutes for everybody and then later on we will have about well 45 to 50 minute discussion if you are fair enough to your colleagues. So we are going to start with Professor Hanoch Gutfreund, 20 minutes and then we are going to continue in the presentation. Good afternoon to everybody. So uh, my topic is not in the core of what Gabi Motzkin described as the main theme of this, uh, of this workshop, yet it serves as an important background. Now you have already heard uh, that I am not a historian. But uh, recently I discovered the joy and satisfaction of discovering interesting documents in archives. That is what most of you do all your life. Uh, and I became interested in the story of the friends of the Hebrew University in Germany after World War II in the context of uh, the discussions of the 50 years of uh, scientific relations, uh, Germany-Israel, and particularly in the context of a project on which I am working uh, with uh, Professor Jürgen Rehn from the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin. And uh, there, uh, one says always that there was an effort, imme not immediately, sometime in the 50s, and I'd say, say a few words about that, to revive the French organization that existed in Berlin uh, before, before World War II. And I shall say a few words in what way it was revived. Uh, and that led me to, to look into what was there, what existed before World War II. And this is a fascinating story. It's a saga that has not been told yet, and it does merit a scholarly historical investigation. In the volumes that describe the history of the Hebrew University, there is an article 30 pages long on the Friends organizations in 19, between 1925 and 1945, and only six lines in that article are devoted 
to the Friends Organization in Berlin, which is a unique phenomenon, and like any other Friends Organization of this university, then and now. Is there a pointer? No pointer? OK, thank you. So well, what you have here on your first slide, I will not show you too many slides. I'll show you a few slides. Uh, you see, the, I'm not a historian, I told you. Historians usually read their lectures. Physicists show slides. Mathematicians write on blackboards. <laughs> so I am a little bit in between. I will show you a few slides. But uh, So what you see here is this. Uh, you, you see there are three names here. It was first a Verband, an Arbeitskreis, a Gesellschaft. And there is, again, a whole story how these Yeah, and there is a whole story. How these names were adopted, what they meant, how they were changed, how they merged. But I will not have time to tell you that story. Now, the Friends Organization in Berlin was, was uh, founded in February 1926, but before that, there already existed an initiative after Weizmann visited Berlin. There was formed a group, a Christ, an initiative of Russian Jews. And they collected money for the Hebrew University and the first donation, and they collected 5,000 marks. And here is the list of the donors. And I give you the list of the donors because it's very interesting. You see, some names it says uh, rich. And very rich, <laughs> very rich. Now the rich and the very rich gave less than the non-rich. <laughs> so another question. Now, we go to a, a, this is the appeal, the Aufruf. The Aufruf published February 1926. The talks, and I have no time to read to you, but I'm showing you this Aufruf and just telling you that this, uh, the, uh, the organization in Berlin worked and donated money through the central organization in Europe, which was in London. The London Friends wanted to publish this outlook in the Jüdische Rundschau. Kurt Blumenfeld, the head of the... Oh, Kurt Blumenfeld, I, I, I like to... <laughs> you should give me a microphone here. Anyway, Kurt Blumenfeld, the head of the Zionist organization in Berlin, refused to publish this outlook in the, in the Jüdische Rundschau. You know why? Because nowhere here it says that one talks about the Hebraic Universität. He felt that the Aufruf appealed more to the assimilated Jews. He felt that the Aufruf emphasizes, that emphasizes the need of Germany, the benefits for Germany, and not the benefits for the Jewish people. The British friends were very embarrassed. They told him, look, we are very embarrassed that so many prominent Zionists signed this, and it is best for them to take care. Now, the next thing that I want to show you, uh, no, this, is the, this is the letter from Kurt Blumenfeld where he explains why he is not going to. And I'm showing you this letter for another reason. Many of the letters in those days, between friends of the and others, people from Karen thought, all were signed mit Zion's Gruss. That disappeared a little later in the 30s, but that is how it started. Every letter has a Zion's Gruss. Now, the next thing here is this. Now, this, I could give you a whole lecture about this. This is the committee. There, is, there was no other organization of the Hebrew University then or now that such, had such a list of names. Albert Einstein is there, of course. It's somewhere there, I cannot see it from here. Dr. Buber is, of course, there. Arnold and Stefan Zweig, the philosopher Kassirer. And you can list, list. There are so many professor doctors 
or Professor Dr. Srabiners here, no other list has something. So it's no wonder that an organization like that, uh, when it first proposed its statutes, it was not a, uh, no, 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 how do I go back? Oh, when it first proposed its statutes, it was not, uh, of course, raising money, fine. But first of all, they wanted to call themselves <coughs> Verband Jüdischer Akademiker, not just. Uh, the other thing, they wanted, they wanted, <coughs> you see here, to have four academic sections, like a university. They wanted to run the university. They wanted to influence the academic develop development of that university. The university, the friends from vetoed that. So there was finally is an ordinary, ordinary statutes which do not mention all that. Still, they acted differently. In 1929, the Jüdische Gemeinde, the Jewish uh, in Berlin, suggested or initiated to raise money for a new chair at the Hebrew University they formed a prestigious committee here. And uh, you, you know, the Hebrew University, when it was established, it started as a collection of three research institutes. Jewish studies, uh, hygiene, what was the, the beginning of the Faculty of Medicine and Chemistry. And quickly new, uh, new, chairs were added, and there was an urgent need to start social sciences. And here, the, uh, the Berlin committee suggests to raise money and to establish a new chair, and their candidate was Franz, uh, Franz uh, Oppenheimer, a distinguished, one of the founders of political science. He wrote this influential book, The State. He was a member. He was on that list. Magnus welcomed the initiative, Magnus from the Hebrew University, but he objected to Franz, uh, to Franz uh, Oppenheimer because he could not teach in Hebrew. They also wanted, they also wanted uh, to send him for one year first, but he said even one year would be too much. A few lectures, yes. So then, uh, here I am showing you, uh, if anybody did not see the handwriting of Martin Buber, so just for that I am showing you his beautiful, very readable handwriting. He was very, very much involved. There were all kinds of debates about this Berlin chair. One can write a, an essay, an article, a study only about that, only about the Berlin chairs. It took three years of correspondence between London, Jerusalem, and Berlin, and there were other, other options. Of course, Martin Buber advocates this one. He's against economics because he writes here that in economics you would need two professors, one practical and one theoretical, and so on. And he also says here that, he, that they suggest that in 1930 they will invite Franz Rosenzweig, but the community will devote 250 Sterlings to the library to buy books in the field of Franz, sorry, Franz Oppenheimer, sorry, in the field of Franz Oppenheimer, the, the students will already have things to read. So this is, uh, oh, now there is another thing. Another, one of the first affairs that the university that the friends of the university uh, dealt with was the story, the library of Gregorius <coughs> Ittelson. Now, Gregorius Ittelson lived in Berlin. He was a philosopher, a logician, a Jewish Russian immigrant to Berlin. Uh, Gideon Freudenthal, by the way, wrote a scholarly essay on his, on this man. He translated 
the popular book of Albert Einstein into, uh, into Russian. Uh, one of his, uh, when he walked on the Kudamstrasse, he passed a Kneipe where there were fascists and they beat him to death. And he died and uh, Albert Einstein himself, Professor Weil, who was a member of this organization, but also the director of the Prussian National Library, they both took care of selling his library, or, sorry, of half of his library sending to Jerusalem and half of it selling and giving it to his daughter. So this is another uh, interesting, uh, interesting uh, episode that I happen to know about through Einstein, through my knowledge of Einstein. Okay, now, uh, now I'm jumping to the 30s. Now the study of the 30s is not so simple because it turns out that when the files of the Hebrew University archives were brought down from Mount Scopus, a few files were lost. And those that described the years 34, 35, 36 are missing. But we have very good documentation of what happened at that organization in 37 and 38. To me, it was very surprising. I don't know how it's to you. How much this organization still did in 37 and 38. In 37, uh, you see, in 37 there is a meeting and they choose a new committee. Why did they choose a new committee? At that time, at the Hebrew University, there was new administration, very proactive. Salman Shoken was the head of the executive committee, and David Werner, senator, was the chief administrator who was very active, and he went to Germany, and he insisted that, that all friends' organizations be very active. In September 37, he writes to the German committee the budgetary situation of the Hebrew University very much depends on donations from Berlin through you. How naive one could be, I don't know. This is September 37. But this is not the end, you see. In, uh, this is a letter uh, to Senator written from somebody who got this letter on November 8th 38. You remember what happened on November 8, 38. This is Kristallnacht. And the committee is still there. And they say that in December they will have a meeting. They will have a meeting. And uh, in that meeting they will decide on how to comply with the, I will, that's fine, with the Wunschliste of the Hebrew University. And, and then there is this last letter that comes from Berlin from, a, it is 14th of November, a week after Kristallnacht. There are only two members of the committee still left there. One of them writes that the building, this building on Meinecke Street, where all the Jewish institutions were located, the building on Meinecke Street, was closed, and we don't know what will happen, how we can operate. So this is the, the sad finale. And now I go to the post-war, and it, I will do it without slides and very quickly, and I'll tell you, uh, you see, we talked about the revival, but what happened after the war is very, very different from what happened before the war. One cannot understand the Hebrew University's effort in re-establishing its friends' organizations in their mode of operation, in was not put it in the context of the overall attempts of the political situation, of the Ben-Gurion Adenauer talks, of the, of the quest of science to serve diplomacy in those days, and also of the different uh, attitudes about which we shall hear later at the Hebrew University in the, in the general public. Now, uh, 
the man who initiated, who urged the university to start Hebrew organization, Friends of the Hebrew University in Germany was Norman Bentwich, who lectured at the university before the war. He was the British Attorney General in Palestine. In the 50s, he was the head of the Friends Organization in London. In 1954, he already urged the university to do that. Mazar, the president then, categorically denied that idea. He tried to do it again in 56. He went to Germany. He met people there. He, he involved, he talked to President Hoyce, and President Hoyce even indicated that he would be willing to give his patronage. He talked to people like Theodor Adorno, like Horkheimer, like Professor Bem, and there was a great desire in Germany to start that. The Hebrew University was still not ready. Only in 1957, when Mazar, when Mazar went to Germany, and he's everywhere, he heard people saying that they are surprised why that does not exist yet, why French organizations are not installed yet, that he gave the green light. And then this young lady, uh, Annie Samuelsdorf, Mrs. Annie Samuelsdorf, was sent to Germany. In a very short time, she succeeded to set up societies of friends in Berlin, Frankfurt, Düsseldorf, Hamburg, and München. Now, in all these things, at the head, very active, were non-Jews, were academics, were public figures, were bankers, were philanthropers. And there is a, a, a report. There is a report of the Hebrew University from 1980. And that reports on our operations in Germany. That report tell us, tells us that French organizations now exist in Berlin, Hanover, Brenner, Hamburg, Kiel, Düsseldorf, Dortmund, Frankfurt, Saarbrück, and Stuttgart, and München. Not, not anymore, but that is what it was. And again, this be, these organizations opened doors, raised funds, hosted uh, professors from the university, and were very active. Now, I'm concluding. In the 70s, in the 70s, when the collaboration, the, friend, the German-Israeli collaboration, the German support diversified, not exclusively Max Planck Gesellschaft and the Weizmann Institute, the DFG got into the picture, uh, the lenders themselves uh, became involved, the Minerva centers were established covering a broad range of, uh, uh, of topics. Uh, then the center of gravity shifted from the co close collaboration, almost exclusively with our friends' organization, to all the other government and public institutions. And that is another story, but I have exhausted my time. So I wanted to tell you uh, what a great, what a great, interesting, impressive saga, this story of friends organization in Germany, for me particularly before World War II, but also after World War II in a very different mode of operation, different players, as I mentioned, with many Germans involved, not exclusively Jews, more Excuse, uh, Jews were a minority there because there were not so many Jews. So this is it. And as I said, one more thing. Uh, I think that this merits a historical study that has not been done yet, does not exist yet. So this, for me, what I told you is to whet your appetite. Thank you.